You know, it's uh, amazing how quickly Christmas comes after Thanksgiving. You hardly get all the kids and grandkids gone until they're back again, right? And for me, that means 44 humanoids descending upon my house, 27 of them are my grandchildren, and 20 of those are under nine. And in their infinite wisdom this year, they have decided, they decided, they didn't ask us, they just decided that they're coming on the 19th and they're staying till January the 4th. That's 17 days. <clears throat> I may, this may be the last you know me in my right mind. <laughs> you know, the interesting thing about kids and grandkids is they ask questions. Just this this infinite number of questions. In fact, I just got curious. I looked it up. I knew somebody had studied this somewhere and uh, <coughs> discovered that kids between the age of five and eight ask on the average uh, 300 questions, 300 to 400 questions a week, 40,000 questions between three years old and eight years old. This is the reason you're so tired. This is a reason this wears you out as a grandparent, right, is this infinite number of questions. Now, there's silly questions, you know, about all kinds of things. Some are important questions. And, uh, but as you get older, you ask fewer and fewer questions, but you ask more important questions, more vital in questions. You start thinking about things on a deeper level. When you come to tragedies or difficulties or problems, you really ask some uh, life-changing questions. There's no greater moment when you ask the ultimate questions than when you or someone you love faces death. And that's where we find ourselves this morning in John 15. I want you to take your Bibles, if you would, and open them to John 15. Because you see Jesus who is coming right to the most critical point of his ministry. Everything had been building towards this. <clears throat> and he kept saying to his disciples, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. I'm going to die. They're going to kill me. They didn't, they didn't believe it. They didn't understand it. And uh, finally, on this week, they thought this is really going to happen. He's going to leave. And they got scared. And so Jesus comes in John 14, 15, and 16, and he gives them what I, what I like to call his his great locker room talk. It's just bringing them in together, huddling them together. And he says, hey guys, I know you're afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I am going away, but the reason is I'm going away to prepare a place for you so that you can come be with me. We're going to be together. Don't worry about this. And also though, I'm not going to leave you orphanless. I'm, I'm not going to just not be here because, and here's the key, I'm going to send my spirit, me, in spirit form that will be with you and in you. What an amazing promise. And so he, he tells them the facts of this in John 14, and then in John 15, he, he gives them a picture that they would never forget because we, we see a lot of times, we understand better in pictures. And in that picture of the vine and the branches, he answers five of the greatest, most important questions in life. In fact, there are five questions that if you don't know the answer to, and if you don't walk into, you will miss what life is really all about. And so we're going to ask Christ these questions and let him answer it in John 15 in his own words this morning. And, and just to make this a little bit more real, I'm going to do something a little unusual. Christ is here, right? I mean, he's, he's here in this room and uh, he's promised to speak to us. So I want you just in your mind's eye to pretend that he's sitting right here, that the Lord Jesus Christ himself is seated in this chair. And if you'll let me, I'll just be the interviewer. That's all I'm doing this morning. And I'm going to 
just ask him some questions, and we're going to let him answer right out of his word, all right? So the first question, Lord, is this. Lord, who, who are you? Who are you? Now look in, in John 15, and he answers this in verse 1. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Now this is a beautiful and easily understood illustration for these disciples because everywhere they were, there were vineyards, they lived with vineyards, they worked in the vineyards, they ate and drank from the vineyards, and they understood what this meant. When Jesus said, I'm the vine, he didn't describe himself as a branch, but as the vine, what he's saying is, I'm the source, I'm the life, everything comes from me, you can't make it without me. Now, he'd been doing this, these I am kind of statements. John records seven of them in his gospel. I am the bread. This made sense to them because if you didn't have bread in Jesus' day, you didn't live. I am the bread. He said, I am the light. If you didn't have the light, you couldn't see. You're in the darkness. I am the door. If you didn't have a door, you couldn't enter in. And then one day he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody, nobody comes to the Father unless you come this way, unless you come through me. And then he said, I'm the resurrection and the life, and I'm the good shepherd. And here he says, I am, now listen, it tells us who Jesus is. I am the vine. All of these things said one thing. I am the source of everything for your life. He, he could have said it if he was speaking to us in our day. He could have used different pictures. He could have said, I'm the power cord. I'm the computer chip. I'm the engine. I'm the fuel. And we would have understood what he meant. We can't make it. Nothing works right without him. He was saying one thing, really. I am indispensable for your life. And you see, we have a problem believing that. You say, no, I, I believe that. Well, the, pro the illustration of that, the reason I say that is because we act like that's not true. We go along in our life. We don't pray. We don't talk to him. We don't commune. We don't ask his advice. We don't seek wisdom from him. We don't depend upon him. We can go through a whole week and never really because we think we're the vine. We think we've got this. I can figure this out. I know how to live life. Many people, in fact, most people live their whole lives without Christ and the great intent of God, you see, we were born in our sin independent, and the great purpose of everything that's happened in your life is to push you back to dependency upon him and the foundational recognition that he is the vine and you're not. So question number one, Lord, who are you? But Lord, there's another question that we just want to ask you this morning. If you're the vine, then Lord, who am I? <laughs> what, what am I, Lord? Well, he, he answers this right out of his own mouth in verse 5. I am the vine. Look at it there in your scripture. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him he bears much fruit, but apart from me, you can do some really good things. Is that what he says? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, we've all got a lot of names, a lot of titles. I have, I have several names. You do too. I'm a male. I'm a dad. I'm a granddad. I'm a 
preacher, I'm a pastor, I'm an author of sorts. I, I have these names that people, different people look at different parts of my life and you have the same thing. But the foundational name that Jesus gives us here to help us understand this morning who we are, he says, he looks at you, he's right here, and he says, you're the branch. You're the branch, you're not the vine. You think you're the vine, you act like you're the vine, but you are not the vine. You are the branch, and that's a wonderful thing to be. Now just think about a branch. A branch, first of all, is created by the vine, right? I mean, no branch is just grown up by itself. It always comes out of the vine, just like you, unless we forget about this. We are created by God, amen? We don't have our origination any place else. And we're created in his image. I mean, you don't find a cherry vine on an apple tree, right? You find a, a vine, a limb, that's the exact representation of the foundational source. And so we're made in his image. We're beautifully, wonderfully, fearfully made, and we're an extension of the vine, right? I mean, the whole purpose of a branch is to extend the vine and to bear fruit and, and to go places the vine is not going to go. And we're created by God to extend his kingdom, to extend his life, to bear fruit for his kingdom. And we're, and, and we're designed as a branch for a very important purpose, and that's to, to bear the fruit that the vine is producing through us. We don't create the fruit. We don't have to come up with the fruit. We don't have to figure out the fruit. We have to just stay in connection with the vine, and then we just bear the fruit that he is producing. Do you realize this about you? Do you know who you are? Have you, have you forgotten that somewhere along the way? I do. I, I'm pretty consistent. I, I forget who I am in two ways. One, I've, I forget that, that I'm just a branch, and so I start trying to be the vine. I'd recommend something to you. I've tried that for a long time. just doesn't work. just doesn't work. And the other side of the coin is I, sometimes I forget that I'm the branch that's the extension of the vine, and I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I get to thinking, well, I'm nothing. I'm nobody. I can't do anything. No, you, you, you have been created in a beautiful way. And God has extraordinary purposes for your life. You say, well, yeah, but I'm, I look at this person. They're a lot better than me, or they have greater talents. No, God, God made you just like he wanted you to be on his tree in his kingdom for his purposes. Who are you, Lord? Well, I'm the vine. Oh, Lord, who am I? Well, you're, you're the branch, beautifully made, but the branch, don't forget, you're the branch. And so you have to ask another question. I'll just ask the Lord, Lord, if, if, if you're the vine and I'm the branch and we're all here, we're the branches, then how does this work? How does this whole thing work? So Jesus answers this right here in verse 4. Look at it in your Bible. Abide in me. Abide. The word means remain in a stable or fixed position. Stay put. Draw near. Be here. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. This won't work any other way. Do you know that 10 times in these 11, first 11 verses, he uses this word abide? That's a little overkill, doesn't it seem <laughs> to you? But no, Jesus knew we wouldn't get it. Robert, if he didn't just say this over and over and over again, abide, abide. You say, well, Lord, what about uh, abide? But Lord, I'm, I'm really good at, I could go out here and do this. No, you abide. 
But Lord, what if this happens? Abide. But this tragedy has come. Abide. But I don't know how to abide, 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 abide. That's how this works. And it will not work any other way. I'm the vine. You're the branch. If you don't remain in vital union with me, if you let anything interrupt your relationship with me, if you try to do it without me, if, you, if your head gets turned and you get distracted and you see something out here that you think is more valuable to you than me and you run off and start chasing that, fame and reputation and, and popularity and what everybody thinks or material things, and that consumes your attention and you're abiding in that, that becomes your home instead of me, then this won't work. It just doesn't work. Abide in me as I abide in you. And as the branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. We get the word abode from this word abide. It means our home. Where's your home? Where are you most comfortable? Where do you want to be? Well, I, I'm most comfortable out here in the world. I'm most comfortable when I'm running with this crowd. I'm most comfortable when I have these things. No, our home should be right here in Christ. I'm never more satisfied. I'm never more comfortable. I'm never more at home than when I'm close to Christ, listening to Him, walking with Him, filled with Him, that's how it works. You say, well, Lord, if that's what I've got to do, abide, then would you just be a little more specific? How do I abide, Lord? That's the fourth question. How do I abide? And the Lord is very clear. He, he knows what we need, of course. He always put the cookies on the bottom shelf if we had ears to hear. And so he comes here in verse 7 and he tells us how to abide. Look at it, right? It's the lips of Jesus. He's right here this morning. He's speaking his word to our heart. And he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done to you. Wow. Now, what does he mean? He means, look, as you're abiding, the way you abide is by turning your ear to me. It's by paying attention to me. We turn our attention to the world. We turn our attention to the news. We turn our attention to ourself. We turn our attention everywhere else. No, I want you to turn your attention to me. I want you to listen to me. Uh, the Proverbs writer says, blessed is a man who sits at the doorstep of the Lord every morning. He's just waiting for the Lord. There's a, a, a psalm that says, as the eye, eyes of the maid look to the hand of her mistress, as the eyes of the servant looks to the hand of the master, so our eyes are on you, Lord. We're just looking at you. That's why we've got to get up every morning and read the Word of God, not to check it off. Well, I read the Bible, and so maybe things will go good for me. That's not, that's not the point. The point is to listen to the Father, because I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I, I don't know what to say. If I don't listen to him, I'm going to say all the wrong things that hurt my wife, that mess up things, that go in the wrong direction. I want you to let my word abide in you. I want you to listen so much that what I'm saying becomes what you're saying. That my will becomes your will. 
that my desires, which are always good and acceptable and perfect, they're exactly, I made you, I know, I know what you need. And so I want, I want you to so abide in what I'm saying through my word and by my spirit and in prayer that, that what I'm saying becomes what you're saying. And that's why he's able to say, and then if you pray, whatever you ask, it'll be done because it's my, it's my words, it's my will, it's my, I, you're abiding in me, you're speaking what I want, you're praying what I want you to pray. And so I will answer your prayers. I love the little poem I've got it uh, in my office on the wall. I look at it so often. I read thy word, O Lord, each passing day, and in thy sacred page find glad employ. But this I pray, save from the killing letter. Teach my heart set free from human forms the holy art of reading thee in every line and prophet, precept, and sign till all my vision filled with thee Thy likeness shall reflect in me, not knowledge, but thyself, my joy. For this I pray. Who are you, Lord? I'm the vine. Don't ever forget that. There's no other source but me. There's no other life but me. There's no other bread but me. There's no other way but me. There's no other door but me. I'm the vine. Well, Lord, who am I? You're the branch. You came out of me. I made you. I have purpose. You're the extension of me. You're to bear fruit for me. But just don't forget, you're the brine. You're the branch. I'm the vine. And how does it work? Well, you've got to abide. You, you've got to stay right here all the time. You, you get off in any way, you, any week. You're just going to mess it all up. You're going to miss it completely. If you're not abiding, well, how do, how do I abide? You let your word, my word, abide in you. And then he says in verse 10, and if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I kept my Father's commandments. So I want my word to abide in you. You've got to listen but you've got to follow. Now, James, the brother of Jesus, was very clear about this. He said, a man who, who looks at the per perfect law of liberty, the Word of God, is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror. You know, you get up in the morning, you've got a shock of hair that's just heading towards Chicago and another one over here going towards Dallas. And, and, and you look and you say, oh, man, I've got to do something about that. And, and, then, and then you forget and you go off to work and people are kind of laughing behind your back and you saw something that needed to be corrected, you just didn't do anything about it. So is everyone who does not do, who does not become an effectual hearer, not just a hearer, but a doer. So God says, this is just not a matter of you, you listening to me, it's a matter of you following me. Anybody in here ever heard something from God, a direction from the Lord? and not done it. <laughs> Can I see those hands, right? And feet. <laughs> we're all guilty of this. And, and when we do, what happens is we're listening, but we're just not obeying, and we miss the point of it all. So the Lord says, is there anything in your life that you're not obeying? Is there any place where you're disobeying? Maybe the things that are coming your, out of your mouth that are displeasing to me. I told you not to say those things. Don't let any unwholesome word, don't let any unwholesome word come out of your mouth. But only such a word, Ephesians 4 says, that is good for edification, fit for the need of the moment, and gives grace to those who hear. Any word coming out of your mouth? then you're disobeying. And disobedience equals disconnection. And you're not abiding. You watching anything? You listening to anything? You doing anything? You saying anything that I've told you not to do? 
listen, if you keep my commandments, then you're abiding. If you go off on your own way, you're disconnected, and it just won't work. So, Lord, who are you? Well, I'm the vine. And who am I? You're the branches. How is this all going to work? You've got to abide. How do I abide? You listen to me, and then you follow me. It's very simple. And I'll give you all the power to do that. Well, one more question, Lord, before we go on this December morning. What will happen if I abide in you, Lord? Jesus speaks to us and he says, oh, I'm so glad you asked that. There's so much that happens when you abide in me. There's fruit. You bear fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, meekness, kindness. You say, well, I have a problem with patience. No, you have a problem with abiding. Because the fruit of an abiding life is patience. Patience. Well, I get angry at people. I don't forgive people. I don't really love. I'm kind of selfish. Well, that's not a selfish problem. That's an abiding problem. Because the fruit that is born out of abiding in Christ is love, right? And he says in this passage, you'll bear fruit. You'll bear more fruit. You'll bear much fruit. And you, you will bear fruit that remains that lasts for a long time. And there's power. Whatever you ask, I'll do. And there's purpose. My Father is glorified through your life. Wouldn't you rather stand before the Lord one day and Him say, your life accomplished the purpose for which I intended, for which I created you out of my life, to bear fruit for me and to have power before God and man and to see my kingdom come and my will be done on earth as it's being done in heaven. And you did that. Well done. And then there's one more thing that I just love. The abiding life is the joyful life. Jesus said in verse 11, these things I've spoken to you Listen to this, so that my joy may be in you, and then your joy is just made full. Anybody in here get tired of being unhappy, <laughs> just discontent, sad? My granddad used to say discombobulated. I don't know really what that means, but I know what it feels like. Just kind of out of it. That's not the abiding life. I've created this to work so that you're connected to me and my life is flowing through you and you're bearing fruit and you're doing in any circumstance, dark circumstances, light circumstances, hard circumstances, easy. You're doing what I created you to do and there's purpose and there's joy. It's a fruit of the Spirit that I produce through you that, that my joy would be in you and your joy would be full. Listen, please, from the Lord as He speaks to us. If we don't have joy, that's not a joy problem. It's not a joy problem. It's not a circumstance problem. It's not a stress problem. It's an abiding problem. You abide in me. I abide in you. My joy will be in you. And your joy would be made full. Some of you in this room remember the old Emmanuel Baptist Church building on 1000 Bishop Street down my children's hospital. I, I was there from the fourth grade to the 11th grade as, uh, as we were members of Emmanuel. I grew up there. 
And if that building were still standing, I could take you to a seat. I know exactly where it is. Fourth row, middle, center, right-hand side. Where the most significant thing in my life other than my salvation happened to me. See, I'd come to know Christ early in my life and but we had moved from Kansas City to Little Rock and and I decided that I want to try to be cool. I want to be like everybody, I want everybody to like me. So I just kind of took my eyes off Christ. I knew the Lord, I loved the Lord. But I just started trying to be like everybody else and I got in all kinds of junk. I knew it wasn't right, so every year at Siloam, I made my annual Thursday night Siloam rededication. And it would last for a few weeks, and then I'd come home, and I'd just be right back in the same junk. My junior year in Hall High School, I got sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was just miserable. I knew it wasn't right. I knew there was more. And so I decided I'm going to try to do better. So I just tried to do better. I don't want these words coming out of my mouth. I don't want these actions in my life. I just tried. And you know what? I, if I'm lying, I'm dying. I, the harder I tried, the worse I got. I could not seem to do the Christian life as a branch alone. And on April 4th, 1969, sitting in the fourth row, center section on the right-hand side, I came to the end of myself. And I said, Lord, I can't do this anymore. I just said, if you're going to do anything with my life, Lord, you're going to have to do it because I just can't do it. And it's as if the Lord said to me with a smile, that's exactly what I've been waiting to hear. And he began to teach me from John 15 who I was. It literally transformed my life. I don't have to produce the Christian life. He is the Christian life. And if I let him lead, and if I'll abide in him, and if I'll concentrate on my relationship with him and saying close and near and intimate with him, he will live his life through me. And I become, as one man says, just a suit of clothes that Jesus wears. Anything in my life of value has come out of understanding these words that Jesus said, that he's the vine, I'm the branch.